Years ago, I, I decided I wanted to give Bible studies. How many of you have ever wanted to be a Bible worker? A lot of folks, yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know how to start, so one of my teachers, who I loved a lot, I asked him what I should do. He says, well, you know what you ought to do? He says, you get, he says first you need to study, and then get your studies together, and then, then get down on your knees and ask the Lord to uh, open the doors for you. Isn't that good advice? Then it's the Lord doing and not in you. So I did that, and I got an invitation to share with the studies in a private home, my brother. <laughs> and uh, he started inviting people over, and the people were impressed. It was a seminar on the book of Revelation. And a pastor invited me to come and share it in his church. I was scared. I get, I get all kinds of indigestion problems and shake and everything before and I got up front. And I remember I'd, I'd go on and on without looking at the clock at two hours. Sometimes people would be asleep in the audience. But the one night that, that the Lord really blessed, the one night that that was just very good, you know, a pastor just showed up and was in the back and he says, you know, he says, I'd like for you to come and do an uh, evangelistic crusade in my church. And so I, I was really frightened. And I couldn't say no because I told the Lord when I laid out those studies that whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. If I can't do it, you're going to have to do it for me. And so I started getting slides and taking pictures out of the National Geographic, and I just worked real hard. And when the time came, I, I, I gave this 10-part uh, evangelistic meeting, and a pastor heard about that up north. And he said, won't you come and give a seven-week evangelistic crusade in my church? He says, we have a lot of occult up here. We have over 13 covens around here, and we need a specialized evangelistic crusade, and there's not a conference evangelist that can handle this type of ministry. And I said, okay, I'll do that, seven weeks. So I borrowed an old broken-down camper, and I, I went and gathered more and more slides, and sometimes I didn't even have the program done until an hour or so before I went out on, on, in front of the people. We rented an old Masonic hall and everything, you know. And uh, one night I showed this little study I had on 666, and I noticed this lady sitting in the front row, and as I was showing, uh, similar to what I'm going to show you tonight, her eyes got big as saucers, just, and it looked like something was holding her in her chair. It looked like she wanted to get out of her chair, but she couldn't move. And as the slides went, and as, as the sins of Babylon were unveiled before her eyes, she just was overwhelmed. I, I kept looking at that lady, you know. I could realize something was going on there. And just to show you how sharp I was that night, just to show you how sharp I was that I'll get the slides in a minute. Just to show you how sharp I was that night, the, the tape recorder was sitting right down in front. And there were two ladies with their Bibles open down there. And I said, I remember listening back to the tape afterwards. You learn a lot that way. And uh, I said, would you turn to me, with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, 10. And people were flipping through the Bible, and you could hear it on the tape. They were flipping through the Bible, and the lady next to her said, What was that that he, he wanted us to look up? And uh, I heard them, so I said, uh, I would like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, 10. And she said, she said Wait a minute, I didn't get that. And the other lady leaned over, and she says, he, he said, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, 10. And she says, Verse 10, 10. She says, That doesn't make any, any sense. I, I said, Oh, excuse me. But by that time, it was permanently recorded. And it was embarrassing. But you know, that lady that was squirming in the front row that night on the way home, she was a Roman Catholic. And these Adventists had had the presence of mind to invite her to the meeting on 666. They weren't afraid, you see. And so on the way home out of the dark, she was very quiet most of the way, and out of the dark she said, Okay, I have to come out. Where do I go? And her whole family is baptized today. It was such a thrill, and, and she wrote me a letter, and she says, I want you to come to my church and share your Revelation seminar, see? <laughs> so we went to her church and shared uh, the Revelation seminar. In another church, we showed it, and a group of evangelical charismatics, hearing that there was going to be a, a religious program, invited a motorcycle gang to come and listen. <laughs> so there was only four or five of these guys, and they had long hair, and they had their Hells Angels outfit on with the leather and everything. Just looked dirty. The, the rows around them were kind of left nice and clear, you know. <laughs> and they sat in the back. Well, they, once they saw the first program, they stayed throughout the entire six weeks. We went through the book of Revelation from verse 1 all the way to the end.
And when I was at the end, you know, I was showing slides of the universe. We talked about what heaven was going to be like and pictures of the galaxies. And I read the last few paragraphs, the great controversy, how we'll fly throughout those, those planets throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity and learn the mysteries and, and understand the cross much better and everything. And uh, when I was standing there shaking hands, that's the worst part of any kind of speaking is shaking hands. Uh, my hands all sweaty and worn out, you know, and people are shaking hands. And this big old motorcycle guy, he walks up to me and he looked at me for a while. And he was just crying, you know. And he said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, the first thing I'm going to do is ask Jesus to give me the words to tell you what this has meant to me tonight. And he just walked up, he's about nine feet tall. <laughs> he, he walked up and he put his arms around me like this and he just lifted me clear off the ground and just, just hugged me, you know, <laughs> and uh, then let me down. And, uh, but you know, that was worth it. That was worth everything to me. And it's been worth everything since uh, a man trained to be a Roman Catholic priest came up. It's the first time he said it's ever made sense to me in my life. He says, I found Christ again tonight. And it reminded me of a great controversy, chapter 606. Uh, unveil the inroads of spiritualism, the rapid growth of papal power, the sins of Babylon. All these things will be unveiled. Thousands will hear these words that, that they've never heard before. They'll be steward to hear these words. Why? Because we've never given it before. There's a world out there waiting. But we went off the track somewhere. And, uh, and I think I have an idea where that might be. Let me read a quotation from you from the spirit of prophecy. It may give you some idea. This is from Present Truth, uh, November 1850. Uh, this is volume one, number 11. And she says here, the Lord showed me that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand by his hand, and that no part of it should be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. When unity existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But since 1844, in the confusion, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. What was the daily? What was that which they were all united on? Well, let's turn to, to Daniel. First turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Now, I'm going to assume you have a certain amount of knowledge of the book of Revelation tonight because I, this could take a whole time, and I, I only have a few minutes to share this with you. Verse 9, Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld the throne till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Now, move on down to verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words of words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now drop down to verse 13. I saw in the night vision and behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was dominion given to him. This is Jesus on clouds but not coming to this earth. He's coming before the ancient of days who's sitting in judgment. This is the investigative judgment and that power that's brought before that tribunal is that little horned beast. That little horned beast is the apostate Christian world. That little horned beast is the power that is to be unmasked and destroyed in the investigative judgment. Now turn with me to Daniel chapter 8. Beginning in verse 8, it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, the he-goat being Greece, 
And when he was strong, the great horn, or Alexander the Great, was broken, he died. And for it, and from it, came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So out of one of the winds of heaven, or one of the directions of the compass, there came forth a power from small beginnings, or in Hebrew, a little horn, which continued to grow in power or waxed great. It moved southward, it moved eastward, and even moved towards God's holy land. It continued to grow in strength. It waxed great even to God's church. And it persecuted them. It cast some of them down, some of the host, and even some of their spiritual leaders were cast to the ground and stamped upon by the wicked power of Rome. Yea, he exalted himself even against or towards Jesus. Jesus was nailed rudely to a cross by Roman soldiers. Then, referring to the little horn, it says about the Roman power, by him or from him, either way, the daily, the hatamid, or the continuance, that which continues, by him, the little horn or Rome, the daily, or that which continues, was taken away. The word taken away here is mistranslated. The word is the Hebrew word room, and it means to, and I wrote it out so I wouldn't make any mistakes, okay? This is out of the Strong's translation, or the Strong's uh, concordance. It says the word room means to set up, to bring up, to be on high, to heave up, lift up, set up on, take up, rise, raise, exalt, give up. It means haughty or higher or hold up or lift up or mount up or offer up or promote. It means to take off, up, or away. It means to breed worms. Now, which one would you choose? The last one? No, how about second to the last one, take away? I would and I'd take the first ones, which means to set up. It means to absorb. And so we, uh, we lo let's look at it again. It says that uh, by him, or, or Rome, the new center of pagan idolatry, the system of the continuance, the system of the ancient Chaldean sun worship, the system of pagan idolatry was absorbed and exalted. And the headquarters, or the place of his sanctuary, was cast down or removed. What happened to the government? We know that the center of pagan idolatry was moved to another hill that had seven hills. And that hill was Constantinople, named after Constantine. And so it was moved away. Now in its place, another power comes in. In verse 12 it says, and, and host, or the host, God's church, was given against. The word him is not there. Given means to put or to place. It's the word al in Hebrew against, or set beside, or with, or among something. And you can find, I have a whole list of quotations that shows that here with this word against, they have taken the least of the meanings. The meaning should be to be placed among, or placed with. And I had uh, Brother Roy Gain, I don't know if you've heard of him. Okay, Brother Roy Gain helped me exegesis out. And, and, and Brother Gain worked with me on this. And they feel that it was a more correct reading, so I'm comfortable with that. And the host of God's church was put with the daily. What does that mean? God's church united with the system of pagan idolatry. The word, by reason of, uh, of transgression, should really be bifashah which means in transgression. So it really should read this, God's church united with the daily in rebellion or transgression against God. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. And then the question comes out, how long shall last this vision how long will this daily continue, uh, this daily and the transgression of desolation to give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? How long will this confusion be allowed to exist?
The answer has got to be until the investigative judgment, when God will raise up a people to make clear the truth that paganism has no part in Christianity and must be separated absolutely, that there is no union between the unfruitful works of darkness and God's people. There is no union between demons and angels. And that's our work. And so he said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, restored, and vindicated. And you were raised up to do that wonderful work. It's an awesome challenge that you and I have today. Ellen White makes it clear. This controversy of what constituted the daily almost tore our church apart in the early years. They wanted to say that, that the daily was the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. Friends, that's blasphemy against God that the system of Satan should be the ministry of Jesus Christ. They wanted to say that, that, uh, that somehow Roman Catholicism stopped or, or uh, removed the ministry of Jesus Christ. But I want to show you something here, this little manuscript. Ellen White quotes here. She replied, I'll tell you who Melchizedek is, or who Melchizedek was. How many have ever wondered who Melchizedek was? I've always wondered. I'll tell you who it is, she says. He was the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Godhead who took the form of humanity and represented the Lord Jesus Christ to that generation. In every generation, Christ has been in contact with people through his spirit. Sure, before that time, the Holy Spirit had to, to form, for, come in the form of a human being. But God, since Jesus had died, he can reach out in Christ's ministry through us. We are part of that Melchizedek ministry today. It never stopped. In every age, God had men by which his spirit moved through. It never was cast down. It never was stopped. The daily is a system of pagan idolatry, and the reason it's called the continuance is because it began in heaven before this earth was created. It came down to this earth, and it caused a fall of our first parents, and it continued. It continued after the flood. It set itself up in ancient Babylon and it continued to Neo-Babylon. It overran God's church and his people. It continued through Rome. It came into papal Rome and it's still existent today. It is the continuance. And you and I are called that that continuance should come to an end. See? So I'd like to show you these slides and give you a little bit of a sample of some of the things that can be done to expose this in a historical way. By the time of John, the old pagan cults were already starting to degenerate. Their buildings were crumbling to dust and they were looking for a new medium. They decided to take the symbols and the religion of the occult and merge it into the fast-growing system of Christianity. There were over 80 organizations under Gnosticism at the time of the apostles, but only one apostolic church. The result was, of course, that in the areas where intellectual learning was following the pagan format of education, the people were trained in Gnostic Christianity, and the result was Alexander, Egypt, and Italy developed a church that eventually crushed the truth throughout the world. But this is in the British Museum, and here you see five, on this boundary stone from Assyria, you see five symbols that represent the sun. Now you're going to have to watch these slides, I'm going to go fast through them. I have about a thousand slides to show you here. And we're going to go rapidly through them, and the slides tell their own story. Many of these boundary stones are literally covered with symbols of the deities of pagan idolatry in every conceivable way. Now, these symbols carry with them the sacred mystery religion of ancient Babylon, where they designed numbers and letters to convey the idea of the secret power of the six, or sex, the cosmic force in nature. And while they worship this monotheistic, pantheistic god, Outside of the ring of the priesthood and the initiation, they created thousands of myths and thousands of God to keep the pe gods to keep the people in abject terror. The supreme symbol in the occult system was that, of course, of the sun. 
It was believed that the sun itself shed the light and life to all mankind. Its color was gold. And so gold became very, very sacred in the mysteries. Now let's walk into some Catholic churches today. What is the predominant color over the altar? It's gold, 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 gold. The cross was the supreme symbol of the sun. The ancients, when they looked at the sun, it formed a cross between the squinted eyelids. Thus, the cross became the hieroglyph of Tammuz, the sun god, born on December the 25th. On the most ancient reliefs of, of, of Mesopotamia, the sun is, is symbolized in the sky as a cross. And here it is on our, uh, on our boundary stone in the British Museum. Now look at some of these cylinder seals, coins. Everywhere you go in the pagan world, you see that cross, the cross. Now, in Alexandria, Egypt, the cross was made up two symbols. Symbol that represented the female and the symbol that represented the male. It represents sexual union or sexual force or eternal life. That symbol was the Crux in Santa or the Ankh as you probably have known it. But do you know where this garment came from? This is an Alexandrian Christian's garment. The British Museum. Evidently the Christians first adopted the cross there and it had nothing to do with the cross of Calvary. It was a pagan symbol in the beginning and it's a pagan symbol today. Before long, the church copied every single symbol of pagan idolatry. The swastika is used in Catholicism. The great Latin cross. Everywhere you look. Now this is a boundary stone again from Mesopotamia. It has a god Shamash on it. The number of his name is 640. But you see this double cross. This four-pointed star representing the sun everywhere. And here's a Catholic altar. St. Paul's Cathedral. Now another uh, manifestation of the same thing is called a solar wheel, a wheel within a wheel with the double cross. It was the, in Greece, it was the wheel of the chariot of Apollo as it went across the heavens. And in Egypt, it was the eye of Hathor, the eye of judgment of the gods. In India, it represented the wheel of life. And there it is all around the great temple of Karnak in Egypt. Buddhist temples reflect this symbol of the wheel of life everywhere in Persia. And in Rome, you'll see this wheel of life. Just a minute here. Okay, we're losing a lot of our slides. Something's wrong. Can, can I run down and fix this for the slide before this? I think we missed a, probably about 20 slides, but that's all right. I think you got the point, didn't you? It was for a holy bowl found in, a, in a, the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula in 1963, and it is exactly the same symbol as the court in St. Peter's Basilica. Same symbol exactly. This is the largest solar wheel in the world, and since a solar wheel is to draw upon sexual forces, the largest one is to draw more power than any of the others. As you look on churches, in their ceilings, and in their floors, and everywhere you look. Now this is uh, Mary with her solar wheel. I'm having trouble with my equipment. Dear Heavenly Father in heaven, I pray that you'll be with us now in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind the powers of darkness in this room and I command you to leave. Dear Lord in heaven, fill the empty place with thy heavenly spirit and put angels around this building, I pray. And I thank you, Father, for being here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, here we go. Now we're getting them again. This is a bishop from the 14th century, and you see he's carrying a wheel in his hands. And this is Mary carrying her wheel in her hands. So this adoption from pagan idolatry all the way from Babylon is still within the church. This is again the wheel of life, the Buddhist wheel, symbolizing the cosmic forces of the cosmic energy and union. Can be seen on this Shinto shrine, this Japanese symbol golden wheel of the sun and if you walk down the street and turn right and walk in the door of the building there you'll be in Saint or, or Westminster Cathedral and there in the first little chapel you'll see this on the floor you'll see it everywhere when you look around the sun had a face in it 
and rays coming out around it. It was a chief deity in the ancient world. Look at this sun. This is the god Apollo on a pagan temple, Greek temple. And see the rays straight representing male and the wavy representing the female. That's Jesus Christ on a Catholic altar. That's a Catholic pulpit. This is behind Christ on an altar. And you see that sun everywhere you go throughout this system. Now, you've heard of the worship of the heart. There's the heart, and your straight and wavy lines around it indicating that it's the worship of the sun. You used to tear that heart out and offer it as human sacrifices. And now in the church, you see that same veneration of the heart is to be seen. There it is in the heavens as the sun. Mary's heart pierced with uh, knives. The red disc can be found in the occult. It represents the sun in Egypt. And now look at this on the floor in a Catholic church. In fact, red discs can be found everything on floors and altars and walls. But this is a symbol of the trinity of the sun. Ra, Amman, and Osiris. And there's a serpent wrapped around the sun here. And this is a Catholic altar. Two serpents wrapped around the disc. Again, another symbol of it is a golden disc. And this golden disc of the sun can be seen throughout the pagan world in every way, placed behind various deities. It symbolizes that they are from this cosmic force, that they are gods. This is Peter, Mary, Krishna. If you look closely at that halo, it's a halo with rays coming out. It's this Hindu god, and there's Mary. And there's Peter. This is called the nimbus. Originally, these symbols can be found in ancient engravings from Mesopotamia as a symbol of the opening of the female womb or the moon. And that, since it was a symbol of life-giving force, was used to represent that. And you see Catholic saints and Mary put in this vulgar symbol. The orb of the sun represented the whole universe. This was held up by gods and goddesses throughout the pagan world. In Egypt, it was the scarab beetle rolling its dung across the sand, and they worshipped it as God rolling the sun across the heavens. But as you see that globe, you realize it has cosmic significance. It represents a 666 God, the ruler of the zodiac. And there's Mary holding it in her hand. Jesus holding it in his hand. Baby Jesus, and here... One of the more beautiful statues of Jesus holding it in his hand. This is Catholicos, or Atlas, holding up the universe. This can be seen in pagan art everywhere you go, but this is a Catholic altar. Holding up the universe, as on the tiara in the Vatican treasury, or high above St. Peter's Basilica, the largest one in the world. Symbol that they are the 666 system. Another symbol of the sun can be seen in this primitive uh, society in Central America. You see the sun, and beside it you see a triangle, a symbol of the sun. The uh, ancient Irish pagans used to carve these triangles on their monolithic stone, symbol of the sun, or the American Indians of this terracotta coin. But as you go to Egypt, that triangle represented the sun god. In Greek, it represented the sun god as well, as you see this tetragrammaton, or the tetractus here. You see it on Roman graves, and here it is on uh, the Rosicrucian Temple in San Jose, California. There's the official symbol of the Rosicrucian order. But this is in a Roman Catholic church. And it's an interesting thing that the Babylonian god Shamash equals 640 because the name that the, of the name of God placed in the middle of this symbol of the sun adds up to 26. So everywhere they put that name of God, in the Catholic Church, over a symbol of the sun, you have the number 666 presented before you. There it is with the, the satanic pentagram. The eyes that stare at you from statues and from reliefs all over the world symbolize the eye of God, they believe, but it's the om, the supernatural force. It's the eye of, of uh, nature. And here on the, the capstone of the pyramid, I uh, don't know how well you can see it there, but right in the center there's a circle with a dot in the middle representing the eye of Hathor in the triangle, and that's where this originated, the eye in the triangle. The eye was terrified the pagan world. Here it is on a Roman grave, someone so terrified of the eye to protect himself in death, he carved a great big eye to say, I am your servant, God. 
on his grave. The Masonic pin with the eye in the middle of the triangle with a serpent with its tail and its mouth around it. And this Masonic lodge, no, this is Santiago de Compostela, the third holiest chapel in the world, according to Roman Catholicism. And as you look up, you see a giant triangle with an eye glaring down at you. This one I saw in a confessional. The priest saw me taking the picture, so he came over and he says, well, what do you want? It was in Italy. And so I, I told him, I, I, was, I, I didn't know what to tell him. But I, I told him, look, I, it's just an interesting symbol, and I, you know, wanted to get. A, he said, "Oh, that's so nice. I just want to know." So it, you can get rattled sometimes, you know. But this is a Catholic pulpit, and you see the eye in the pyramid in the middle there. A Catholic youth group, similar to the Pathfinders, and here you see two together. The one pointing up, the triangle pointing up, represents represents male. The one pointing down, female. In union, it represents a sexual force, and it's used in witchcraft to call up demonic forces through in theurgy. But all around that, you see the 36 decons of the zodiac, indicating that it represents a 666 god. This was designed by Aleister Crowley, and in the center of but you see the, the word soul, meaning the sun, and the number six. This is in a Catholic church. This is a Rosicrucian order. This is a Jewish Kabbalistic symbol, and this is a Catholic altar. Catholic, 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 Catholic. And everywhere you go, the symbols of Satan staring at you are there. This is Mary, and on her shoulders, that satanic symbol. The six formed in the wax was formed by the bee. The bee, it had six legs, and it was, they believed that the bee was a symbol of fertility. And since it made the, the six-sided uh, geometric shape, they worshipped that shape. And you'll see bees all over papal crests. You'll see it all the way through the churches on candlesticks and in the Vatican's and the walls and the carving, a symbol of the 666 God, the sacred uh, pentagram, a symbol of Satan used throughout the occult at, at the point of human sacrifices and carrying on the rites with witchcraft and the dead can be found on Roman Catholic altars everywhere you go in the world. What's the difference? I don't see any difference. The ancient scallop shell was a symbol of the universe. It represented the sun god as it ruled the seas at night. Here it is on the head of Neptune. Here's Atlas holding it up as the universe or on this Roman grave with a stairway to heaven as a great scallop shell. Venus being born from a symbol of sexual force. And here she is again, born from it. Everywhere you look in pagan idolatry, you see the scallop or the conch shell. Here's a Venus figure holding that scallop shell. And here's an angel in the Catholic church holding it. And everywhere you go in the church, you'll see that. As you enter St. Peter's Basilica, there's Peter baptizing Jesus by sprinkling with a scallop shell. His brother is supposed to be symbolized, Santiago, symbolized by the conch shell, and that's him. But it looks far more like a Buddhist statue than anything else, and the people were kissing the scallop shells all over his back. In St. Paul's Cathedral in London, as you go down to where they carry on the funerals, and you look straight up, You'll see over the room a great scallop shell in the under part of the church. And there it is behind Jesus' head. That means that their God is the Antichrist. There's the official papal crest, a scallop shell, symbol of astrology. Here it is, a scallop shell equated with the sun at the Chiesa del Jesuit, the church of the Jesuit in Rome. Anciently, they believed that the God, the sun, ruled in the seas as a great fish. In the legends of Babylon, that God was called Owains and came and gave civilization to mankind. But in India, it's Vishnu, and he's a fish god. Of course, in the Greek religion, Poseidon, and in Egypt, Isis takes the form of a, uh, a, uh, a fish when she's looking for her husband. But in this situation, this uh, Wasserbecken, or this great water labor, was before an Assyrian temple. I want to show you the, pic the, uh, I want to show you the, uh, the hieroglyphs on this. I need to change the carousels. <coughs> And this is the Pergam Museum in East Berlin. It was in a part of the museum we'd never seen before. It just happened to be open that day. And this uh, is the size of a swimming pool, but it was a labor, like in their sanctuary services. And on it are carved the priests all around it. They're wearing fish clothing, and they have fish's miters, according to Laird, on their heads. This fish is miners were worn in the land of Canaan by those who worship Dagon, or the sunfish god. This is the god Sibyl of Asia Minor, and there's that fish miter on her head, definitely a symbol of the sun god, but these are Catholic priests. And even today, since the time of Babylon, that fish is still sticking up on top of that guy's head. 
And you know, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but these symbols are important to that church. She would rather give up the Bible and give up her traditions. Here we are again, back at our boundary stone, and the next symbol I want to point out is a three high horned crown, representing ruler of heaven, earth, and the underworld. This was the symbol of the rulership of ancient Nimrod, the sun god. It represents a 666 god, and here it is on Krishna's head in the Hindu religion, that when the Jews apostatized, this became their Yahweh. The, uh, as you look up above, you'll see V, W, V, W. A W is two Vs, and a V is the number six. That's 666, 666. And as you look at their God, the Kabbalistic God of the apostate Jew, notice that it's part bull, part man, and part eagle. And uh, one more. Part bull, part man, part eagle, and part lion. And on its head it has a tiara. That symbol means that the, the Pope is 666. It's more variably a symbol that he's the God of 666 than having vicarious filii dei on his crown, just having the crown on his head. But this is the one they have down there in the treasury today. This is a sexual symbol. It represents the female womb. You'll find it throughout the world. In ancient Jericho, they found little rooms outside the main house where they had babies' heads lined around the base of the, the room, uh, skulls, and in the center was this, this phallic symbol like this. But on the top of it, you see this crescent. It's a symbol of the womb of the female God of heaven. It's not the moon. The moon crescent is shaped in a different direction. This represents the womb. You'll see it everywhere in the fertility religions of the world. Luna, the Roman fertility goddess. Here it is, the birth of Mithra from the Zoroastrian religion. And this is one of the early goddesses of Babylon, Lethu, standing in a crescent. And this is the modern fertility goddess of Roman Catholicism, standing in a sexual symbol. Standing in a symbol of the womb. And here she is standing in the horns of a, uh, a reindeer up in Scandinavia. Now, I would like you to see this. I, you can't see it. I'm sorry. It's so dark. But uh, this is a picture of Mary. You might be able to barely make out that on her chest she has the high priest's plate. Can you see that? And on her hair she's wearing horns. Her mitre's horns. She has been placed between God and man. The Roman system, Christ is not the priest, but Mary is the priest. And you have to pray to Mary in that system. But that mother worship of Mary goes back to a base of fertility worship that took in the entire civilized world. And the Roman church knew that they had to have a fertility goddess. This is called a sistrum. It's a sexual symbol representing the sexual forces of nature. And the women used to dance scantily clad as the music went. But this is being held in the hands of Isis, Queen of Heaven. Here she is in the book of the mysteries by Manly P. Hall. I, Isis, am all that has been, that is, or shall be. No mortal man hath ever me unveiled. The fruit which I have brought forth is the sun. And as you see her again, here she is as a Madonna with a child. The child is the sun. And the signs of the zodiac are all around her. This is a Madonna in the Vatican. And as you look closely at her son... You see the sun. Isis and the baby were little statues that were worshipped in Horus. Isis and Horus. You'll see this is Krishna as a baby with her Madonna and a Japanese Madonna in Durham. Everywhere in the world, the Madonna and the child. This is a Roman Madonna and child. Isis and Horus adopted into the Catholic Church is Jesus and Mary. It has no place there. It's an abomination to God. Child worship is a worship of sex, and little children are offered as human sacrifices. And this is a child of Prague. Jesus can be worshipped as a child in one corner. In the other corner, you have a statue of the full-size Jesus. And they'll worship both statues as if they're Jesus or they're God. This is Shamash, or the sun god placed in the crescent or the womb. It represents sexual union. You'll see it on cylinder seals all over the world, in Persia, everywhere you go. In Egypt, you see the great disc there with the Trinity in the crescent. It is on a Hindu god's headpiece. This asterisk is the sun in a crescent in Greece. On this coin, you see it in front of the deer's head there. And this again from Mesopotamia, you see the sun. And there's a handle underneath that thing. Isn't that interesting? There's your sun in the sky, and it's a crescent, and it's got a handle on it so it can be held up and venerated. And it has a disc in it. Now let's look at a Roman Catholic monstrance. 
It's held up at certain times a year and the disc is placed in the crescent. Just as in pagan idolatry. In fact, that crescent is called the lunette in French or the moon. That wafer is an interesting study. It has no place in the communion of God's people. It's a worship of the ancient grain god. That grain god, the god of nature, was eaten in every pagan culture of the world. The gods of nature was believed to have to be ingested to gain their fertilizing power. Even in Mexico, it was the mace god that was given to the people. They, the priests called God into it. In the religion of Serapis, in Egypt, they offered up wafers to the god. As I was down in the, in the grave of one of those Egyptian kings, and the guide was outside trying to get, he was, the people were moving away, and I was in there, and it just dawned on me, I was standing there beside the grave of this man who claimed to be the Pope back then, and I looked at the wall, there was an altar painted on the wall, a golden altar, and on that altar were three golden cups, and in front of those three golden cups were six white wafers. Six little circular wafers, even in Egypt. In fact, in Egypt is where the church adopted the circular white wafer with IHS on it, meant Isis, Horus, and Serapis. In Greece, the wafers were used in this way. They took three bulls, they set them up there at the Acropolis of Athens, and put three wafers on the altar. The bulls, these great white bulls, would sniff around. One would eat it. He would be held by a blow from one man and his throat slit by another. And then the, the skin would be removed and the people would be encouraged to, to climb over that bull's body and tear every bit of flesh they could get from him. Take it and eat it raw to get the fresh blood in their, their mouth and to take pieces of it and bury it in their feet. And this was carried on in different countries in different ways. One country would be a goat. Another country would be a human being that was done this way. But they believed you had to get the God into you. The pagans were so infused with this idea of eating the God. And it was part of the Mithra religion that was the state religion of Rome that the church had to adopt a blood sacrifice where you ate part of that sacrifice. It's the system of cannibalism. And now it's part of the uh, Roman Catholic worship. Mithra especially was the important religion. It was Mithra that brought in sun worship, Sunday worship, and it was the religion of astrology from different uh, uh, religion astrology from ancient Babylon. Underneath the ground, they always met, and there they were initiated before these ancient altars. The churches of today are built, many of them, over the old temples of Mithra where the church first encouraged the Christians to meet. Beneath this great cathedral, there's an altar to Mithra in the basement. Now here's a priest showing the host to the people for them to adore. Now you'd think that that host representing Jesus Christ would be symbolized on these great golden lampstands in the Vatican. Uh, you'd see maybe the face of Jesus, or you'd see something that represented the Lamb of God. But as you look closely at these candlesticks, there is a face on every single one of them. Now I want you to look closely at this face. This is the God of nature. This is the horned, hoofed God with a pitchfork from ancient Babylon. It's the grain God. It is Satan. And these poor people, thinking they're worshiping the same God that you and I are bowing to Satan in this system. The hot cross buns uh, presented in the Catholic Church. When the Pope does this Mass, it's a black Mass. It's the worship of Satan. And when it was done on the White House lawn, I believe this country was cursed. There it is being displayed before the people. Another thing that's done in the Roman Catholic Mass is the drinking of grapes, believing it's wine. This was the worship of the ancient god Bacchus, the god of the grapes, the god of drunkenness and revelry. And they believed if you drink those grapes, you were drinking the wine or the blood of the god, and intoxication was him living in your body. When the church drinks that, claiming it's actually the blood of Jesus, they're not copying the communion. Not the communion that you and I believe in, but they're copying the idea of drinking the blood of the God through grape juice. And this is, I'm sorry you can't see this better, but this is on a chalice. One of the chalices they use in the mass. And I want you to look very carefully. You can see goat's horns up above. But down below you see a goat horn coming out there to the left, down at the bottom. And you see little hair sprinkling up at the top between it. Now just below that are two eyebrows and I'm sorry it is on the slide but I don't think you can see it tonight. If you look you'll see two very evil eyes glaring out at you underneath that. It's the face of Satan and it's on that chalice. <clears throat> 
When Satan fell from heaven, he brought with him a religion that would place him as Christ. And he's not willing to give that religion up. He took the symbol of the serpent, which at that time was a symbol of deity, and made it his own symbol. And it's to be found everywhere in the world from Enlil, Lord of Demons, a serpent that waits in the path to destroy mankind in Babylon, to Canaan, where the Canaanites wore these seven serpent hats on their head, to Mithra worship, who was, was revealed in the form of a serpent lion. You go to the Orient, and there the dragon is everywhere worshipped. It's Satan. In, in India, you see this great symbol of the universe. The canopy of the heavens symbolizes a seven-headed serpent. In Egypt, it represented the cosmic forces that everything was created from. In fact, indeed, the serpent, the urea, the sacred asp, represented Egypt itself. Here's the uh, chair of the pharaoh, and either side of it is a winged cherubim, the place that Satan once held in heaven. Now on either side of this sun god, even the baby, Tutankhamun, had two little winged serpents placed beside him. The serpents represent everything from the gates of the soul to the soul itself to the sun god in the heavens. And that convoluted body of the serpent represented the transmigration of the souls. Now this is the stairway into Hatshepsut's temple tomb. And as you look closely, you see a winged serpent and the body of that serpent convolutes all the way to the top. This is in Mississippi. And even the American Indians worship the cobra. The V and the O come only from the back of the cobra. And you can see it up in the right-hand corner. 1,300 feet long. It was a tremendous feat for these primitive people to do. But the religion came from Egypt. Central America, they worship Quetzalcoatl, Kuku Khan, the serpent gods. They offered their human sacrifices to them between these rattlesnake pillars on the Chukmal there. But I want you to look at the uh, temple on the other side over there. The stairway going up on either side has serpents guarding the stairway to heaven on either side. They guarded the entrance of the temples in Greece, Asculapius. This is Asculapius, the serpent god, god of healing, god of drugs. Apollo, Athena with her serpent. And here's that healing god in Rome adopted. On a Roman grave, two winged serpents bringing the soul to heaven. Even the Scandinavians worshipped the winged serpent. Their boats were either serpent boats, and then they changed the, the front piece on them to be a dragon boat in war. Their stave churches reveal their veneration for the serpent. In order to get into the sanctuary, the sta uh, stave church in Oslo, you'll find that you have a serpent with wings, and the neck of it just coils around and around, sometimes ending in grains, sometimes ending in pine cones, and many times ending in the head of a serpent. But you have to pass through these lattice work of the serpent to get in. In Chinatown, I noticed this handle on a door into a building. Or in the Buddhist temples, you'll see the serpents there. But this is an interesting temple here. It's a, it's a serpent with a, uh, a bird's head on it, a winged serpent bird, and a winged serpent lion next to it in the door handle, a winged serpent goat next to that, and a dragon next to that. You have to grab those handles and push through to get into this sanctuary. Would you go in? I don't think I'd go in. But as you get away from it, it's St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco, one of the most modern Roman Catholic church. And as you look down at the courtyard, there are three rows of crosses, six in each row, six, 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 six steps to the top of the sanctuary. Everything revolves around six in New Babylon as it did in Old Babylon. That serpent can be seen everywhere on graves and carvings. And this over the head of Jesus in St. Uh, Westminster Cathedral, Asculapius, the serpent god. Everywhere you go. This is the Vatican, and there are more dragons in the Vatus Khan, or the Divining Serpent Center, than anywhere else. Candlesticks and the mosaics. In fact, the pillars of Bernini's canopy are, are copied after the idea of the ancient serpent around the tree. Serpent pillars. These from Mont Falcon's uh, Mysteries shows serpent symbolizes the good and evil cosmic forces holding up the mundane egg representing the earth. And at the top of the pillars, at the canopy of Bernini, at the center of Roman Catholic worship, is a great big egg. And as you look underneath it, you'll see bees all around it, symbol of sexual force. And here it is, the rope on this, uh, this symbol here in San Francisco. The rope was a symbol of the serpent. But most astounding of all was in Bernini's Hall in the Vatican Museum, and there the church was symbolized as a great winged dragon a golden dragon. In the treasury, Pope Sixtus and five popes call themselves Pope Six. On his tiara are six serpents intertwined at the top of it. The lightning bolt was a symbol of the serpent power, believed the contact between the God of heaven and the womb of the earth to impregnate it. 
The water was the heavenly sperm, and anyone that carried in his hand a lightning bolt was believed to be that cosmic force. And so from the time of Babylon, you'll see on the cylinder seals these magic staffs or magic croziers. This Assyrian king holds one in his hand. The coil represents the roll of thunder, and the little flashes represent the flash of lightning. Here's Osiris holding his serpents, an Egyptian staff. Here's Tutankhamun with his little crozier. And this is an Etruscan god holding the serpent in her hand. Athena with her crozier. A Mayan holy man holding his serpent staff. A Japanese holy man holding his little serpent staff. Scandinavian serpent staff for their priests. Etruscan serpent uh, staff. Babylonian or Mesopotamian serpent staff. And this is a Roman Catholic serpent staff. Every bishop has to carry one. And there's so many from every bishop. All had to have his own staff style just for him. Some were carved out of the bones of what they believed to be saints and especially venerated in the church. I have so many pictures of these, I've only given you just a little scratch or a little smidgen of them, really. This is in the Eastern Orthodox. Their croziers have two serpents on them. This from the Isle of Patmos. Though there are some that are made like flowers, like the one on either side of the papal chair today. But bishops and priests still carry them. They're flaunted before the world. And here's St. Nicholas carrying his serpent crozier. This is a, uh, a Jesuit prelate holding a double serpent crozier in the Chiesa del Gesù. This is Adad, my lord, holding the lightning bolt in his hand, which is a pitchfork. And you'll see that throughout the religions of paganism all over the world, the pitchfork, Mithra, Hinduism. And this is in a Catholic church over a grave. And that's supposed to be Jesus with this uh, lightning bolt coming out of his head. Or there's the cross with the lightning bolt coming out of it, just as in pagan idolatry. Now, another way of doing that is three fingers, as illustrated by the sun, sun god, giving a blessing to uh, a Babylonian king. And here his hand is three fingers, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, or wherever you go, those fingers are seen throughout the world. Even the old Egyptian priests are holding that symbol in their hands. This is a Spartan god, a Roman god, Caesar holding that symbol in his hand. This is Apollo, the sun god from London, holding it in his hand. In fact, fingers could be carried about your neck or in your pocket to protect you from the sun's dangerous ways. Now, uh, this is very likely where these came from, from the altars of the god Zeus. And these votive hands can be seen everywhere throughout the pagan world. These from the altars of the pagan temples to initiate the pagan hierophants. And as you look at it, you see a number of symbols. You see the pine cone, the two fingers representing male and female, a thumb representing the generating offspring, the serpent wrapped around the hand, a goat's head with wafers underneath it, and a Madonna and child down below. The back of it is covered with astrological symbols. It is a symbol of the 666 God the cosmic force in nature, and you'll see it throughout the whole church. Everywhere you look, you see saints carrying that symbol in your hand. Even today, the Pope still uses that satanic symbol as he claims to be blessing people. Another variation is this, which was formed representing the male organ. You'll see this fleur de lis, or this flower, all over the occult world on Isis and Babylonian reliefs. Here it is on a Dionysius. And uh, here we have it on a Catholic candlestick. Catholic floor. Another form of the lightning bolt or the serpent, this held by the god Zeus casting the lightning bolt is here seen in the Vatican. A symbol of her authority over heretics. I missed that last one. Notice the arrows in this Mithra lightning bolt. It was a sexual symbol. It's seen in the hands of Krishna here. Or in this... Uh, this Asclepian temple, the doctor holds a symbol of sex in his hands. Or on an altar in Babylon. Or in someone's pocket to protect them from evil forces. The Romans formed this arrow as a symbol of the sun and sacrificed Christ by nailing these arrows through his flesh. The church has taken these three arrows, a symbol of the 666 God, and placed them above and on their altars and in their windows and on their floors. Everywhere you look, you'll see this symbol of 666. Here it is holding up a chalice. Chiesa del Gesù floor. And here's a whole monstrance that's only made of these sexual symbols of arrows. 
They were ancients worshipped the evergreen tree. They worshipped the sacred palm as a symbol of life, and that symbol can be seen on floors, on walls, and on ceilings. Now, here's another symbol that might be interesting to you. If you look and you see the um, pine cone in the hands of these demon gods from ancient Mesopotamia, you see it everywhere on those reliefs. In Egypt, it represented Osiris. That represents the phallic god. Here it is on the head between the horns of Isis. There it is again. Here it is in Tutankhamun holding a serpent staff or a pine cone staff in his hand. A Hindu god with a pine cone staff. Quetzalcoatl with his pine cone. A Greek god with her pine cone. A Roman god with his pine cone. Kind of gets sick of pine cones after a while, don't you? Uh, this is the god Bacchus with his pine cone thyrsus and Dionysus with his pine cone thyrsus. It represented the male sex. And females are seen carrying it too, representing this symbol. You know where the biggest pine cone in the world is? I'm going to show you. Now these are Catholic pine cones here. Catholic altars. Catholic artwork. Catholic, uh, instead of a cross on the top of one church, they had a pine cone. That's the biggest one in the world. It's found at the Corte de Peña in Italy. It's three stories high. And it's the biggest pine cone in the world, the biggest symbol of sexual force in the form of a pine cone. The Pope carries a pine cone staff with him at the base of the cross that he carries around as a pine cone on it. He's a continuation of Dionysius and the sun god. The ancients worship, I'm going to just blip past these, the ancients worship sex. Supreme symbol of sex, of course, was that obelisk set before a temple. The shadow would go into the womb of the temple and sanctify it. Sexual power. There it is, you see in this fellow here on this Roman grave with that phallus symbol. And this is carried on throughout the churches of the world at the Vatican. You find one there in the courtyard to perform the same function. Pillars represented the union of heaven and earth. Again, they were a sexual symbol. And around the court, you find the... Uh, the colonnade of Bernini, just a great bit of pillars, symbol from pagan idolatry. When you see the spires on the churches, it's not glorifying God. It should never be there. The yin and yang represented that God was a one force that was both good and evil. And here it's seen on the head of Bacchus. He's got two heads, one smiling, one frowning. Or on this feathered cap from this Mayan priest, where, or Inca priest, where one's black and one's white. Indeed, black and white in the occult represented the union of good and evil in religion. Here it is in India and in Rome. And in the Masonic lodges, they have to be initiated over a black and white floor, the union of good and evil. This is the Rosicrucian initiation floor in San Jose, and it's all black and white alternating floor. And now, you find in the court of Babylon that the floors were black and white. And this is a Roman Catholic floor. Roman Catholic sanctuaries all through the world have black and white alternating floor, symbolizing it as the religion of the merge of good and evil. The black god, his name was Stur, Saturnus. Nimrod was black. The foundation of the uh, Egyptian mysteries was the black Osiris, and black gods can be seen in every culture of the world. Shiva, uh, Krishna was a black god, and at the heart of the Vatican is a black god. The statue of Jupiter was brought there from the Pantheon, and the people bowed down and kissed his feet as if he was, uh, as if he was Peter. No one, Peter would never allow anyone to kiss his feet. It's just such a terrible thing. But here you see it was the part of worship of the occult world to kiss feet. You might rec rep recognize this fellow. He's the head of the Krishna movement. He's dead now. But there's a picture of his feet so his followers can kiss his toes in a picture. And they believe that the spiritual forces come through and fill you through the lotus toes. I asked one of the bald-headed fellows that was standing nearby me there in the temple and he told me all about it. When you go to the Vatican, people are lined up to kiss the toes of Peter. The holding of the keys is pagan. Here's Mithra holding the keys, and here's the Pope's keys. The concept of hell was adopted again from all the way from Babylon through Egypt, and the church has used it to bring about psychological terror to her people. This is a Buddhist hell. The ancients believed that the clouds were the wings of the eagle, the wings of the sun. Eagles are worshipped from Babylon all the way through the mysteries, everywhere you look, and this is an eagle in a Catholic church. They represent the Holy Spirit in the Catholic Church. Oh, glorious Father in heaven, we lift our hearts to thee tonight. 
in utter and total helplessness, Lord. Each one of us feels our great need of Thee, that Christ should be so real to us that the things of this world become totally dim. Dear God, I direct this prayer into the most holy place of your heavenly sanctuary. And I ask that thy atoning blood should be applied to each soul here tonight. That if there's anything in any life here, they'd be willing to, to give it up rather than lose that eternal prize and cause suffering upon our Redeemer. Dear Lord, I, I just pray that if there are those who have separated from thee, there are those that know that their heart isn't right with you. That tonight, Lord, that'll be made right. And, the whole, and heaven will be their home. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.